part of the problem in education is that we easily become so engrossed in the life of the ego uh, that we cease to cultivate any awareness um, of that other pole of our being in the immortal beyond or our mysterious personhood. We seem to know so much through our, sc our schooling and in all the multifarious things we learn. Maybe we become masters of scientific thought and technology. Indeed, look around today and know how much scientific and technological progress we've made in the past 2,500 years. Pretty crazy, eh? And yet, something's a mess. Because although our knowing things of this sort has increased exponentially, our awareness of that inner tension of soul, whereby we recognize both the poles of our existence, not just the mortal pole, but also the immortal one, our attentiveness and our sensitivity to this tension has badly atrophied. Many of us no longer seem to feel it. Perhaps we did when we were small children, but through schooling, through maturation and having learned all too well what counts as serious and real in the grown-up world of egoic concerns uh, with mastery and success, we've all too easily lost our spiritual sensitivity towards these poles. We've become numbed to such originary experiences. The price, precise experiences, incidentally, that gave rise to metaphysical language in the first place. Numbed as we are, how then do we regain our sensitivity for such things? <clears throat> Especially when perhaps we can find no teachers around us who are not numb themselves, or who are able to recognize these poles of our existence. Indeed, Meritain remarks that the ability to see and to attend to the whole child, not just his or her individuality, is an absolute essential capacity of any genuine educator. In this regard, Maritain writes, What I am criticizing is that false form of appreciation of the individual person which, while looking at individuality instead of personality, reduces education and the progress of man to the mere freeing of the material ego. Unquote. Put simply, <clears throat> it seems that both teachers and students are prone to mistake the psycho-mental states of the ego for the true self or person. Recall here I Socrates' call uh, towards a national or pan-Hellenic manner of education that would secure the Greek birthright, to have all of its pleonectic drives satiated. Recall similarly the manner of Dewey's understanding of inquiry, how inquiry must be grounded in the immediate interests dictated by the problems encountered by students in relation to their inner lives, their ambitions, their tentative goals, in short, their own egos or psychomentality. Never, ever, in Dewey's view, must a student or a teacher seek a final end, goal, or telos that does not have its source in these egoic interests. Do you see now? Just how cantankerous a view Maritain is espousing of education here over against the dictates of progressive educators and pragmatists? And how difficult the job is it to explain such things to people who have, for whatever reason, become numb to suffering, the inner tensions that would render any discussion of such matters sensible to progressive adversaries? Of course... Yet another difficulty we encounter, even when we're not wholly numb to the experience of these inner tensions, is that, speaking rather crudely, some folks just can't take the suffering involved. Think about it for a second. Always feeling that tension? Always being pulled apart in two directions? Always recognizing in one's finitude a corresponding infinity? Or intimating in one's experience of flux a corresponding yearning for that which, was, which does not rise and fall but eternally resides? There's much discomfort to be suffered here. 
It is, in fact, this discomfort that propels the philosopher, or the one who cannot be content with any little bit of knowledge, but only with knowing reality as such. This discomfort propels such a one to pursue wisdom. And yet, there are those who will not tolerate the unending nature of this yearning and this discomfort and the discomfort of this love, let alone its heightening through practices like philosophizing. Such weak kneed men will look for efficient ways to shirk this tension, and whenever possible, they will allow their love to derail. For instance, perhaps they will assume they are already perfect having imagined themselves in their own fantasies to have reached that divine pole already. Or perhaps they might fool themselves into that slumber in which we suppose ourselves already to know everything. Or again, perhaps like so many of the bloody madnesses that fueled wars throughout the 20th century, they'll relinquish the tension they feel towards the immortal beyond by embracing in its stead, a perfectly constructed system of thought, or an ideology that offers to resolve all inner tensions by replacing any concern for the divine pole with some other false end like race, or state, or the almighty market economy. Or perhaps, like Dewey, they will adopt the pragmatist stance to deny that there is any truth to be known. There are, in short, a myriad of ways for our attentive search to know our personhood to derail. Maritain speaks of this problem in the following passage. <coughs> the same man, in his entirety, is an individual and a person. He is a person by reason of the spiritual subsistence of his soul. And he is an individual by reason of that principle of non-specific diversity which is matter and which makes the components of a same species different from each other. My individuality and my personality, thus defined, are two aspects of my whole substantial being, to which correspond two different poles of attraction for my inner and moral development. I may develop along the lines of personality, that is, toward the mastery and independence of my spiritual self, or... I may develop along the lines of individuality, that is, towards the letting loose of the tendencies which are present in me by virtue of matter and heredity. Unquote. Our awareness of our own personhood, and by extension the personhood of others, grows in proportion with our willingness to allow reason not simply to calculate means towards the diverse ends set for us by our egoic states, but rather when, by our faculty of reason, we seek out its ground. Moreover, our awareness of our personhood grows in particular with the development of our freedom over instinct and sensual desire. Coming to know ourselves as persons implies loosening our self-attachments and the force of our pride over our lives. It implies self-sacrifice and striving towards self-perfection through love. Now that we've discussed more thoroughly what Maritain means when he uses the term person, and why this word matters so deeply in his understanding of education as liberation, let us once again think back to our earlier discussion in this lecture of those rights and freedoms guaranteed by such documents as the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the American Bill of Rights. <coughs> Indeed, I put it to you that such considerations matter deeply to our understanding of democratic education and teaching for democratic citizenship. Now that you understand Maritain a little bit better, you can start to see how, where before it looked like perhaps these entrenched rights and freedoms were in conflict with the sort of freedom sought out by Maritain, now we can see a remarkable and deep affinity between these two meanings of freedom. How so? Well, once you've seen into the depths of your true self, once you've seen 
and actually recognized your personhood, then certainly you must also recognize this personhood among others around you. Thou art that. And each person besides yourself, too, is such a thou. And given this deep ability to see that you have cultivated, right? you've got this ability to see, whether as a student or as a teacher, how much more care and attention will you now afford to the rights and freedoms of others, eh? Indeed, where before uh, you may only have seen competing interests and egotistical men, selfish, disparate actors, all vying for power at the irrational behest of their diverse ego passions and in furtherance of their heaps of desires, now you recognize something deeper in all men, including yourself, including even your enemies. Now you see behind this facade and this deep delusion that infects the mass of men, and you're able better to empathize and to love them truly as your neighbor and as a second self, for you see them as persons. Indeed, there is a danger in the way that we ordinarily go about teaching social studies. For certainly, it's appropriate to, assure, uh, to ensure our students have read through and discussed the Charter, like the Canadian Charter, with all its rights and responsibilities. But what are they to think about these rights and responsibilities when all that they are given to know about themselves or goaded to know about themselves and others concerns their drives, their dreams, their goals and passions? When knowing thyself has come falsely to be equated with knowing your thoughts and ambitions, your likes and dislikes. Knowing only such things, they know nothing of their personhood, let alone the personhood of others. They just know their ego, right? They know their psychomental states. This is indeed why we might teach our students stirring lessons about morality and ethics, why we might offer them engaging moments in which they are invited to think about the importance of being kind and fair to one another, as well as about respecting each other's rights and behaving responsibly towards one another on the one hand, while on the other hand, they go about bullying each other in the hallway perhaps even directly after having scored a fine mark on their social studies test. Although it's unfashionable nowadays to say so, coming to see the truth will set you free. Indeed, without actually seeing, there is really no convincing reason to believe what one is told about the sacrosanct nature of our liberal democratic rights and freedoms. After all, throughout most of history, such rights were not at all recognized, or at least not universally. The Greeks knew, perhaps better than anyone, the truth that in a world where all is flux, and where there is no eternal ground over against which all things might be measured, there can be no legitimate claim for anyone or anything to exist. Indeed, all things rise and fall, coming into being and falling out of being ineluctably and without consideration of this or that claim to justice. All things might just as well not exist as exist. Nothing that becomes or changes has any right to be. The pre-Socratic philosopher Anaximander puts the matter rather poignantly in the following poetic statement. The things that perish into the things out of which they come to be, according to necessity, they pay the penalty and retribution to each other for their injustice in accordance with the ordering of time. Unquote. In short, when we're willing only to affirm the aperontic depth out of which and into which all becoming rises and plunges, when we do not likewise affirm, through the experience of that tension we recognize in our soul, the epicana, or the immortal beyond, then we have no other ground upon which to speak of justice, except that all things pay for their existence, however fleeting or extended, however righteous or vice-ridden, by their own destruction according to the blind ordinance of time. In a similar vein, I'd say that the ancient wisdom of the mythical old satyr known as Selenus resonates alongside Anaximander's words when he tells us that 
the best thing for a man is not to be born, and if already born, to die as soon as possible. This is certainly a hard wisdom, but remember that it's grounded in a vision of reality that sees only the flux and suffering of all things that rise and fall. It's not spoken from the vision of that mysterious person within which, or within each individual, which evades destruction, and which being eternal is not brought down by time's ordinances. Shifting gears a bit, <clears throat> I want to discuss one final aspect of Maritain's educational philosophy with you. In particular, I want to have a look at what he has to say about two very important powers of the soul. These being the intellect and the will. We'll end this lecture with a discussion of their significance in education. <coughs> to begin, uh, what's meant by the will and what's meant by the intellect? These terms have a long pedigree. Uh, most folks who discuss such things say that Whereas the Greeks knew a lot about the intellect, it was the Christian writers who discovered the will. I've always found that assertion a bit suspicious, but let it stand for now. After all, most of the very best discussions of the nature of the will and the intellect were undertaken in the Middle Ages uh, by the Christian scholastic philosophers. As I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, among his many other claims to fame and notoriety, Jacques Maritain is also well known for having been the guy who resuscitated interest in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest scholastic philosophers in history, and the only man ever turned into a saint by the Catholic Church just for being so damn smart. This being the case, what Maritain has to say about the intellect and the will is pretty much what Aquinas has to say about them as well. Basically, the intellect is that power of the soul we associate most closely with the mind, with knowing and understanding. And what the mind knows is what is, what has being, what is real. The mind knows reality, right? And here's an interesting point to ponder, ladies and gentlemen. One that is foundational to all ancient medieval thought, in fact. Whatever is, is true. And the mind knows being as truth. And because all being, being what is, is true, well, that means that whatever is can be known by the intellect as truth. I bet that just gave you a headache. You can rewind it and listen again if you like. But really, it's just a roundabout way of saying why, according to ancient and medieval philosophers, the mind was said to have a capax omnium, or the ability to know all things. Now that doesn't mean that we'll ever come to know everything. That would be incredibly arrogant and unrealistic. In fact, although men like Thomas Aquinas said we have a capax omnium, they also knew that everything that is must always remain at its core, deeply and fundamentally, a mystery. Aquinas spoke this truth very well when he wrote towards the end of his life that all the efforts of the human mind cannot exhaust the essence of a single fly. And moreover, that all he had himself written, and he wrote a lot, ladies and gentlemen, was like straw. So empty and fraught is even the most vast human knowledge. Nope. What the scholastics meant by speaking of our capax omnium wasn't at all arrogant. They were merely stating the obvious. Namely, that if the mind knows being through its intelligible aspect is truth, and if everything that has being is in fact true, then the mind can know everything that is. Put another way, to say that the mind cannot know all that is, would be as much to say that there are things which are real, but not true. But that's a nonsensical contradiction. Anyway, 
This business of the, the intellect's capax omnium will be important later in our discussion. As you're probably aware, <clears throat> most of our language <coughs> um, for knowing uses the metaphor of sight. Seeing something has always pretty much been associated with knowing its nature. Hence, the mind's powers have always been intimately related with seeing. For this reason, the intellect is often called the eye of the soul, and it's lauded as the most divine aspect of the human being. Indeed, it's uh, through the mind's contem uh, blah, blah. Indeed, it is through the mind's contemplative power of seeing that ancient and medieval philosophers and mystics came to say that human beings might immortalize to the extent that such a thing is possible for a mortal being. This contemplative seeing is precisely what is required in order to know what Maritain calls the mystery of personality within each human being. As you may recall from our past lectures, the Greek word for, contemplative, for the contemplative power of the intellect is theoria. Theoria is to be distinguished from reasoning, another power of the mind. For whereas reasoning moves from point to point in a line towards its object, discursively, theoria is non-discursive, simple gazing. It sees what is all in one look. In theoria, or that loving gaze that seeks to know the deep reality of what is, the intellect sees through all ego fluctuations into what eternally resides. And most wonderfully, the writers of the ancient and medieval world point out how this act of contemplative seeing closes the gap between seer and what is seen, between knower and what is known, such that the distance between the two disappears entirely, and each becomes the unity, the other in a unity. Hence, when the mind reaches out to know its highest, most beautiful, and best of all objects, in catching a contemplative glimpse of it, we too become by our participation in its form immortal and divinized in like fashion. Much as the saying goes, the kingdom of God is within you. The Thomistic scholar Joseph Pieper explains this del delicate matter of contemplative seeing in a way not disagreeable to Maritain, who is also a Thomist. Pieper remarks that to have a form means to be a specific being, and that each <coughs> thing is what it is because of the form it has. Therefore, to know means being able to have the form of other things, to be the other thing, to be identical with the other thing, to be all in all." Unquote. So the mind, or the intellect, is just like that. When it knows, it takes on the form of the thing it knows, becoming identical with it. Here, once again, we have the capax omnium of the intellect. And as the mind is capable of knowing all things, so too is it able to be all in all. Where knowing implies identity between knower and what is known, the distance between subject and object vanishes. As Meister, as Meister Eckhart once put it, even though the sense object does not give existence to the I, insofar as it is an I, or a being, and the I does not give existence to the sense object, insofar as it is a being, nevertheless, insofar as they are in act as the I seeing, and the object being seen, they are still one. In one and the same act, they are the I seeing, and the object being seen." Unquote. Eckhart continues, take seeing away from the eye, and you take away being seen from the object. Similarly, take away being seen from the object, and you take away seeing from the eye. 
So in Eckhart, as in Piper and Maritain, to see and to be seen are one and the same thing, inasmuch as they begin at the same time and continue, cease and revive, originate and die, all at the same time. To recap, then, just because of the intellect's ability to see and to know, and just because this ability implies a uh, participatory union of knower with what is known, and of seer with what is seen, such that knower takes on by knowing the form of what is known, just because of this power of unity through contemplation, so too are we persons, <coughs> or beings, made in the image of God. For when we come to know ourselves, and because the highest and most sublime object of our intellect is the ground of all truth and wisdom, namely God, so too are we, by participatory knowing of the divine, also godlike and divine. So too are we persons, then, in our deepest, most mysterious nature. This is why, incidentally, all the ancients held that uh, held the intellect in such high esteem. Not because they were a bunch of cerebral, smug, smarty-pants types, elitists, or gymnasts of the intellect. Not at all. Their reasons for praising the life of the mind were not so aristocratic or arrogant. In fact, to understand them, one has to first peel away all false self-concern and egotism to find the mysterious person within. Hopefully knowing this will help you understand why the criticisms you often hear about the ancient Greeks and the medieval scholastics are so misplaced and unfair. Maritain, following his hero Thomas Aquinas in this regard, holds the intellect as being of greater stature than that other power of the soul, the will. For it is the intellect's power to behold God, and in beholding Him, to become one with Him. This power of union with the divine, of what Aristotle called immortalization, is not granted to the will, which rather desires after the good. However, only one, or one only desires what one does not yet have, and what one does not have securely and seeks to continue to possess. Therefore, inasmuch as one wills, that means that one's having of the good is yet imperfect. For this reason, Thomas always esteems the intellect as greater, because in its union with the good experienced as truth, the intellect is divinized, whereas the will disappears, disappears, for once its most sublime object is obtained, the will is satiated and ended. Nevertheless, this does not mean that the will is unimportant. Not at all. It is really, in many ways, more important. For what is the will? The will is that power of the soul that loves being, that recognizes being as good and desirable. Without the will, without the desire for the good, the true, and the beautiful, that drives the whole soul in yearning to seek out its beloved, there could be no seeing. There would be no contemplative loving gaze. It is the will, after all, that chooses the good. It is the will that reaches out in yearning and in love towards what's lovable, and indeed towards the ground of all that's lovable. Sure, the reasoning faculty of the intellect can ferret out all sorts of truths discursively, but it can't do so with the mind's desire to do... Er, ah, sorry, but it can't do so without the mind's desire to do so, can it? And that motivating desire is itself furnished by the will. And not only that, reason can only seek out those sorts of truths that are known discursively. In other words, 
Reason can only seek to know those aspects of reality that entail ideas and images, that deal with multiplicity and duality. But when it comes to ultimate reality, to what is not multiple, or to what lies beyond all duality, well, reason's screwed. It can't get you all the way. Only the will can. And only a will that's purified and transformed by a love that is cleaned of all its selfishness, all egoism, and all duality. Only such a love prepares the intellect for its immortalizing vision of what is. Okay. So hopefully now we have a bit of clarity about what is meant by the will and what is meant by the intellect, about their relative statures, and how they must work in tandem with one another. So why am I having you consider all this? Well, Maritain contends that because education deals with what can be taught, it refers to the education and formation of intelligence more than of the will. Put slightly differently, although Maritain thinks training for each person's moral character is absolutely essential, he observes that the direct and primary responsibility of the school is not moral, but intellectual in nature." Unquote. Everything, in other words, cannot be learned. What is most important in education is not the job of education, and still less that of learning, in his view. And this holds most especially for the will, or that power of the soul that loves, desires, and chooses the good. Let me conjure up a very poignant example brought forth by Maritain. He remarks that, for man in human life there is indeed nothing greater than intuition and love. Unquote. So far so good, right? Yet despite the fact that education should always remain committed to these things, Maritain goes on to say, Neither intuition nor love is a matter of training and learning. Each is a gift. That is why, says Maritain, there are no human methods um, or techniques of getting or developing charity any more than any other kind of love. There is, nevertheless, education in this matter, an education which is provided by trial and suffering, as well as by the help, the human help and instruction of those whose moral authority is recognized by our conscience." Unquote. Similarly, recall what you maybe have learned thus far in your classes about moral or character education in schools. Surely we all would like to see our students grow up to be fine young men and women who are kind and compassionate and who possess those qualities that were referred to long ago as virtues. But Maritain, much like Plato, as you recall from our readings in the Mino, likewise says that virtue too is not something that can be taught. Rather, what does a great deal for virtue is love. Because the root hindrance to moral life, says Maritain, is basic egoism and the chief yearning of moral life. Liberation from oneself, and only love, being the gift of oneself, is able to remove this hindrance and to bring this yearning to fulfillment. Unquote. <clears throat> so what can we learn about the nature of what we are doing as educators from this discussion of the will and the intellect. <coughs> to put it simply, teaching's domain is the domain of truth. It is the domain of the intellect. Our teaching, therefore, addresses the, in the intellect directly, but the will only indirectly. It is chiefly through the instrumentality of intelligence and truth that the school may affect the powers of desire, will, and love in the youth, 
and help him or her gain control of all those tendential uh, inner dynamisms, those passions, feelings, wants, and fears. Now, this doesn't mean that school education, aimed as it must be primarily at the cultivation of the intellect, has no great power to affect the will. Not at all. With regard to the indirect action on the will by means of intellectual enlightenment, the role of school education is momentous indeed, writes Maritain. For in the teaching of true or false knowledge, um, there is the efficacy to either liberate or to hamper the spiritual energy of love within the soul. In other words, the things that we teach our students, those inklings of truth that we lead them towards, these things do matter in the cultivation of their loves and therefore of their will, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's actually a very good thing to remember. And it is the reason why I believe it's very important for us as teachers to always, wherever possible, challenge our students to spy with their intellects the higher beauties and the nobler truths and the greatest goods. It's why, for instance, in my own teaching, I don't shy away from talking about the great classics of literature to my students. It's why I don't cower from philosophizing with them, despite the fact that some parents may think philosophizing is a waste of time. For as Maritam puts it, the education of the intellect in the highest things offers indirect instruction to the will as well. Such instruction helps kids to develop a sense for spiritual realities that otherwise they may never have begun, begun to cultivate. And when that sense is cultivated, so too might a love for such things begin to grow within them. Nonetheless, Maritain's point about how schools may directly teach the intellect but only indirectly educate the will is well placed and worth remembering. Now, concerning the possibility of any direct action upon the will to educate it and to shape the character of our students, Maritain writes that this objective chiefly depends on educational spheres other than the school. In his view, the place where the will is directly educated is rather within the family unit and at the church, the temple, or the synagogue. For it is in these places that children have their character formed by family ties and moral, moral instruction more fundamentally. It's in such places, contends Maritain, that they are most especially exposed to loving and being loved, to the deep matters of the heart, to the molding and shaping, that only the example of mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, grandfathers and grandmothers might provide. I think Maritain speaks truthfully here. Certainly, it is the case that not all families are so loving and instructive, except perhaps in the negative sense. For children learn by negative examples just as much by positive example, I think. And yes, I do not think, or rather, I, I, yeah, I do think that the family is a sacred place where children should know that they are most especially loved with a, condition, a love that's unconditional. A love that is largely beyond the purview of us as teachers who lack the intimate family ties with our 120 plus students each and every day. Nonetheless, although Maritain speaks the truth about these things, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is worth remembering that for some kids, we might be one of the few faces of kindness and sources of love in their lives. And yes, parents are most certainly great role models for love, but I'm a parent, and I know myself that I'm not always a very fine model for my children. I know that I fail them in terrible ways, often due to my own ignorance and selfishness. 
my busyness, my fears, my anger, my pride. These things get in the way of me being all things to my children. And frankly, I'm so glad that there are other people. <laughs> and that they're their I'm so glad that they are their own people. That they have their own minds about things. That they see things differently than I do. And that there are plenty of other decent people around them who can influence them in positive ways. So what I'm trying to tell you here, in closing, is that even though as teachers, our effects upon our students with regard to the education of their will, mainly accomplished indirectly through the intellect, I still think that we do a bit of direct education of the will, like parents do as well. We are, after all, in loco parentis, or in place of the parent as teachers. Consequently, I think that our teaching by example, our ability to love our students and to see them truthfully, our ability to listen to them, all these things exert a kind of direct influence upon the formation of their will. This ends our discussion of Maritain's Education at the Crossroads. I hope you enjoyed his book and found something worthwhile in the exploration. <laughs>